Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us today. And apologies that we're starting a few minutes late. Um, we at Liverpool are really pleased to have Yorgos Mina come to visit us from St. Andrews. Um, so a bit of background, Yorgos did his master's and then his PhD at Warwick in statistics, and then moved over to systems biology part to work with David Ranch and continued working on statistical methods and mathematical methods to explore large oscillatory systems, specializing in sort of stochastic ones. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm particularly pleased that he could come and join us today. And yeah, Yorgos, the floor is yours to explain to us your recent work. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks a lot, Mirella. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, as Mirella said, uh, I was at work for my uh, PhD and postdoc, and this kind of started there, this work started there, and my background is statistics, and then moved to kind of systems biology, working with dynamical systems, mainly stochastic dynamical systems, and so on, and particularly oscillations. So, yeah, I kind of spent about half of my time, research time, on, on this topic. And so it's, yeah, it's about oscillations and those that usually involve lots of uh, variables, uh, so kind of fairly large systems. And we want to simulate them, want to kind of uh, run simulations to kind of see how they behave over time, uh, analyze different aspects of them, and also make inference, statistical inference, meaning estimated parameters and so on. Do it in a sort of efficient way, which I'll explain what I mean efficient, uh, hopefully, in a bit. So, so uh, the plan is to motivate uh, this uh, work by oscillations, talking about the oscillations in biology, from about two examples of systems that I kind of uh, work with usually. Then take a step back, talk about reaction networks, talk about stochastic modeling, exact and approximate models for reaction networks, and then introduce our method, the PCLNA method, and uh, yeah, talk about simulation, how do we do parameter sensitivity, uh, and uh, yeah, about uh, estimation, Bayesian uh, parameter estimation. That'd be the uh, kind of uh, latest work on that and how do we apply the different things. Here, if I get handled. Yeah. Right. So, um, one reasonable question is why do we care about oscillations, right? To start with. So, you know, as in usually in applied maths, you care about the maths and the application at the same time. So, it's interesting mathematically because you have these non linear dynamics there, the oscillatory dynamics, and the stochastics, uh, stochastic kind of part, which kind of bring challenges in both. Uh, from both sentiment and both ways. And uh, on the other aspect, the application in biology, especially in molecular biology, have lots of oscillations for many different reasons, external factors of the sun, the moon, and so on, but also internal factors of the biology of, uh, of different organisms. And yeah, so it's interesting in, in both uh, ways, in some sense, to study with those uh, study oscillations. One of the ones that I work with is the circadian clock, uh, which Mirella knows a lot more about, but uh, also working with it a bit. So it's the circadian clock is this daily rhythm that we kind of have in our organism. Uh, so it's like, you know, roughly 24 hour uh, periodicity. And uh, yeah, it kind of regulates, or it works with, you have a central clock somewhere in your brain and then in every single cell of your body, you have uh, you know, uh, secondary uh, uh, these daily rhythms. And they sort of uh, regulate your hormone levels, they regulate the time that you, you, know, you want to eat, or you want to go to sleep, or wake up, and so on. So it's kind of the last four decades, people are getting a, a very interesting in the role of the clock in different. Uh, for our biology fundamentally, but also in different diseases and cancer and so on. So you have common biology, chronotherapeutics, uh, fields that uh, are, are kind of hot at the moment. And so all these people are learning a lot of stuff about the clock. Some basic characteristics that we know, obviously they have oscillations, 
they, they did the oscillations, 24 hour oscillations. Uh, if you see the data that they gave the high stochastic, so the stochasticity is an important factor there. And also they involve multiple genes interacting between each other in complex ways. So you have large and complex systems to, to take uh, to care of uh, with the clocks. Um, right, unfortunately, this is on the references, but this reference should show up soon. So I won't be played by the authors about my uh, that's a paper of the clock, a particular model of the clock. So the second system is the nuclear factor in the NF kappa B system. It's a signaling system which responds to signals of inflammation or stress that you have in your body. So it's a kind of the main regulator for uh, kind of sensing the inflammation in, in uh, an organism and then activating lots of processes like. Uh, the immune system response uh, genes or the cell cycle genes and so on. So it has a big role in inflammation and you know, get inflammation in cancer, in also inflammatory diseases and so on. So it's one of the, uh, has a huge role in generally in the biology. You see that probably coming up in every single disease basically, but you see it has some role in there because you typically get inflammation in, in many situations. So, it's a different system, completely different system, but the basic characteristics are the same. We have oscillations. Now they are one to two hour oscillations instead of 24 hours. The steel oscillations, the highly stochastic. You see some data here in the plot. And uh, yeah, it's again involves multiple molecular species interacting in complex ways. So in this setting where we have uh, yeah, complex systems with large kind of number of, uh, of variables involved uh, relatively and you have um, yeah, oscillations and stochasticity we want to build the right tools the right models methodology algorithms and so on but we're able to uh, simulate them be able to estimate the parameters the model parameters want to analyze them in different ways we want to do this in a kind of a uh, way that balances between speed, computational speed, and uh, accuracy as well. So we want to do accurate models that are also can cope with these levels of complexity. Okay, so that's the second part where I go one step, uh, those big, uh, one step part and introduce slowly the reaction networks uh, setting and so on. So this is a diagram of the circadian of the Drosophila circadian clock. Um, and you kind of see the main components of, of this network there. So the bubble, the, the, the nodes, they are the species of the network, the molecular species that we have. So we have, for example, pair mRNA, that's a gene, period sort of gene, and the time gene, continuum gene. And it's in different forms, so in different forms. This is a protein, phosphorylated protein, and so on. And they call complexes and do all kind of different stuff. And the kind of arrows, they indicate the transitions that are happening. So, for example, oh, because that's we're not, yeah, I'll use my arrow thing. So, you have the, the pair mRNA, for example, here being translated, being transported, if you like, to pair protein. And in this transition, and then every single arrow is showing you some transition that's happening in the cell. So what do we measure? The, what are the variables and the state vector that we have? So the state vector is, uh, yeah, is this xt, which has 10 dimensions, because we have 10 variables, 10 species in the system, and every component of it uh, measure the population of these species. So the number of copies that we have of the uh, corresponding species, the I1 would be the I species in the system. So it would be, you know, how many pair of RNA we have at a given time would be X1 at that time. So um, now the transition that I was talking about, they, in this setting, they are reactions that happen by biochemical reactions, which they cause, in this case, the speed jumps. So we can uh, note them by this x, the state vector x becoming x plus mu r, where mu is what we call stoichiometry. You know, so let me uh, 
Yeah, um, oh, we can find the video, but yeah, is this not better? Yeah, that's yeah, better. better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they call the speed jumps remove from X to X plus mu R. For instance, in this reaction where the kernel RNA becomes per protein, then you lose one molecule from each population to the first population, and you gain one molecule in the third population, so you have minus one. Zero plus one in all zeros for the rest for this reaction. So, and each reaction will have a corresponding uh, discrete jump. Now, regarding the times for the reaction, so how long it takes to have a reaction, we need to make some assumptions here. So, the assumption depend on the setting. In the setting where we're talking about the chemistry of, of the you know, the cell, then we need to make some biochemical assumptions, which I'm not going to go with, you know, the mixing the population and mixing work together and so on. And if you make these assumptions, then the reaction times are modeled as random variables. They are exponential random variables. You have exponential distribution, and the rate in this exponential is a function uh, which we denote double dr, which, which is a function of the current state. But that's what I need to keep here, but it's not just the current state. And, and under this assumption, so if you are in the current state and waiting for the next reaction to happen, all these different reactions are independent on the variables. Yeah, so these kind of assumptions of the well mixing and so on, they give you also independence for the next reaction time. So if we put all this together, then we get a stochastic process. X is a stochastic process, which is a Poisson. Because of this exponential distribution times, it's a jump process, meaning that you make discrete jumps and it's in real time, so continuous time. And it's inhomogeneous. I'll talk about this in a minute. And you can describe it in two different ways. You know, this is the time evolution equation, you say. So the current state is equal to what we had before, plus the transitions that happen, which are measured in this way. And then uh, we have the master equation, which is uh, from, if you're familiar with my four process, there is the forward, 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 you know, forward equations, which describe the evolution of the uh, uh, transition probability. So it tells you, okay, what the probability of going from one state to another at the you know, future time. And now, okay, so let me again go a bit slower and talk about an example which. Okay, it became very much more familiar, unfortunately, I'll say in the last years, the SIR uh, models with the epidemics, which have been used for the COVID and so on. Uh, so we're not dealing with volatile species, we're talking about populations or human populations, but still the same kind of uh, uh, framework of reaction approach applies here. We have three populations. The susceptible individuals infected and recovered individuals in this simple simplistic model of the epidemic. And you have only two reactions happening, infections and recoveries. Uh, they have these reaction rates, which notice that they are functions of the uh, interacting populations, you know, for the reactants. And, and then yeah, you get exponential times for each of these two reactions. So uh, if we want to find when is the time of the next reaction, either the recovery or infection, what is the minimum of those two, which has a nice distribution of the probability of the exponential. So what? that's less important. And uh, right. if we have an infection, then we lose one susceptible individual and gain one infected individual. And yeah, similar thing for the recovery. So if you want to put that into the time evolution equation, it will look like that to be the current state is equal to what we had earlier at time zero, plus the number of infections that we had times the transition that happens every time we have an infection, and the similar thing for the recoveries. Yeah. Now, one thing really to emphasize is that the reaction rates are functions of the current state, yeah, the current state vector. You have these in, uh, well, in all reaction networks, really, they're always a function of the, the, the current state. And they can be nonlinear functions, they can be kind of strange hill functions or so on that we get over the rates. Um, yeah, 
Now, the fact that the uh, functions of the current state makes this process inhomogeneous, and in practice, that means that we cannot solve this equation. We don't have an analytical expression for this transition, the transition probability. So if you want to find what's the probability of going from one state to another, then you don't have an explicit expression for that. You have the equation to see how it both, but you don't really have the analytical expression to really study the system properly. So you rely on simulation when you're working with this exact model. There is an exact stochastic simulation algorithm and it's called Gillespie in, uh, or stochastic simulation algorithm from SSA, which is easy to implement because you see you just generate exponential times and just you want to find what's the time of the next reaction and which reaction happened, which is uh, easy uh, to do and easy to implement. But it's very slow. The reason being that it generates every single reaction that happens. So you need to know every single transition that happens there. And you can imagine that if you have lots of them, like you have in the clock, some of them are slow and they take a lot of time. And in the meantime, you have all the fast ones firing all the time and they slow down. So when you uh, have systems like the call, uh, like the, the clock, it's, it's not possible to really use that even for simulations. That's why you have a lot of approaches for speeding up simulations and analyzing the system and uh, probably doing estimation and all these kind of things. So that's where I'm, I'm working on on approximate models. Uh, I'm not going to cover all the literature, obviously. I just want to mention briefly uh, two main approaches that I don't use before I focus on the ones that I use more. So tau thing. Uh, it's one which kind of makes the assumption that the rates don't change in short time, so you choose how short transition you can make in some times, then you don't need to generate all the reactions, you just need to know how many happen in, in that tau uh, length interval. And that speeds up simulation, but you don't, you know, you don't have a solution, you don't, you don't have a transition probability, the transition probability expression for for the well, then when you make this assumption, so again you kind of rely on simulations for analysis, and yeah, it's very hard to do any kind of inference with it. The other one is the chemical large one equation or diffusion approximation, which approximates the Poisson random variables with normal Gaussian random variables, and you end up with an SD, so has to differential equation even um, here, so that's uh, even faster. But again, you cannot solve this as thing. There is no analytical solution for this. So, you know, you have to use some sort of numerical uh, uh, scheme to get a simulation from it. So, analysis is a bit restricted by that. And inference, people have tried that with, say, the SIR model, but not uh, been able to do that with the clock. It's extremely heavy and hopeless, really, to try to do this with the large system like the clock. So the one that I will use more is called linear noise approximation. The derivation is a bit, uh, well, it's, it's less easy to explain compared to the other two. It cannot, so you need to define a parameter omega, which is a volume parameter. This is inversely proportional to the stochasticity. So you have higher omega, lower stochasticity. And that omega goes to infinity, you have no stochastics, you just have the, the old systems. And you can write it, and then, sorry, and the way you derive it, you kind of tailor expand this master equation that we've seen earlier. And you kind of kill off terms that they are small enough because omega is large, when omega is large, they, they assume that they're small enough, they are ignored. And then you also need to use the central limit theorem to approximate. Uh, plus one with Gaussian variables, normal random variables. And you end up with something that can be written in this form. Actually, you have the, the current state is a sum of two components. The first component is the classical macroscopic OD, the thing that you might be used to if you are working with dynamical systems of any sorts. You, you have this kind of system. Uh, and, and that's, yeah, it's a solution of that. And then the other component is stochastic. So it's a solution of an SDE, which is even here. But the critical thing about this is that 
this is a in the form, the SD is in the form that we can solve. So you can solve this SD. And the solution can be written in this format here. So you get familiar with state space process. Uh, it's just a state space, uh, yeah, uh, process where you have, you know, the current state will be the state that you're aware of before time is equivalent to CT plus some thousand, some normal uh, uh, variance around it. So to know these matrices, the CT and the VT that drive the dynamics, you need to solve uh, two matrix for these systems. So, but the thing is, this, uh, all these systems, to solve them, you just need to know the macroscopic, the OD solution. So there's a bunch of all these to solve, but once you solve them, you know everything that you need to know really, to run simulations, to do analysis, and so on. So it becomes uh, very fast to do simulations. Uh, because this is Gaussian, which you have this normal distribution here, so this is also normal, and then this is deterministic. So XT now is, is a normally distributed thing. So you have a normally distributed random variable, which allows you to do lots of different kinds of analysis. And, and you can do statistical inference as well. So everything works quite well. Okay, this is too much. I'm just showing the LNA for the SIR model just to kind of understand a bit into this context. Maybe things to mention, you know, this is the classical idea we have of the epidemics. And uh, you solve that and you get the first component, and then you have two matrix ODs. These are the matrix that you need to solve the, these ODs. You see that they are all the functions of the macroscopic uh, state. So once you solve that, then you know, you know the, the distributions that uh, for the system. Right. So if you're doing things with LNA, things are, you know, they're not easy because you still have to worry about the numerical um, solutions and so on and things like that. But for this setting, things work, which is not very usual compared to the other models. All the other models that we've seen you have to deal with a lot harder uh, computational uh, problems. Is it accurate though? Well, in most cases, it's not that you expect you give something, you, you do something. So it's not accurate in most cases, but it's accurate in some specific cases which are very useful. So if you're making short transitions in planning, then it's accurate. Uh, how short depends on the kind of system and the stochasticity that you have, but there's always a window that you can uh, move in the future and still be accurate with the LNA. And it's also accurate when you, you know, you have linear dynamics essentially. And that might be the case when you are very close to a stable point of the system, a equilibrium point. If you're close to it, then the system will remain mostly for you know, that state for long times. And the LNA approximates that very well. So there are underlying reasons for this, but there's too much to go into them. But essentially, when you have linear dynamics, the LNA works very well. So how does, does it work when you have oscillators? No, it doesn't, especially in the long time. So here I'm showing you the phase space so and putting two each of two variables of the system of the ten dimensional system against each other. The black is the old E solution and then red is the stochastic trajectory uh, generated by the Gillespie algorithm, the SSA. And so um, you leave this run for eight and a half oscillations. In this case about 24 hour oscillations, so now eight and a half days time and simulation. Um, and I'm collecting, I'm doing this 3,000 times, and I'm collecting it, you know, the, the state at eight different time points. And um, right, so that takes a week or 10 days to run. So for one set, it's okay, but you know, if you're going to do it for to study, you know, what happens in different parameters, it becomes impractical. It's not so practical. You cannot really do it uh, unless you have this time available to you which I don't. 
So that's why we're doing the approximation. So the LNA, you can work out, and it's an analytical expression for the distribution. So you can work out the distribution. I'm showing the control plot. And you see that in the first round, after the one cycle, it seems to be, you know, we, we got more formal comparison to show that uh, it's approximating this fairly well, even after the one cycle. But then, you know, you see that the second cycle and so on, it, you know, the, the, the stochastic trajectory kind of be, be the bottom, drift along this uh, limit cycle solution, whereas the LNA stays, you know, the location is the same, like we had in the beginning, you just expand in this direction, the congenital direction, and you kind of face the approximate FTD. Uh, so, right, we still want to choose the LNA because it has this, all these other nice properties. So we have to understand whether why that happens and whether we can fix it. Yeah, to find a way to fix it. So, um, right. So going back to the theory of deterministic periodic dynamical system, we have that uh, if you have in the massive distance an attractive limit sample for this periodic solution, then you choose a phase and, and draw a section through it. Then the dynamics all this. Section, they are nice linear stable. Yes, yeah, so they have linear stability. So I said, okay, maybe in the stochastic dynamics are also nicely behaving. So to do this, we said, okay, we're going to run our simulation, and every time it's crossing the section, we're going to collect this point. So we did this 3,000 times, and well, eight and a half cycles and 3,000 times. So we have this. Uh, Distributions of the first return there, so the first crossing, the second crossing, and so on, 3,000 times you get you can draw a histogram and smooth it like I did here. And you see that you know they have the same sort of location, they are symmetrical more or less. And, and so that gives us hope that you know it's behaving nicely as we were hoping. So we went and computed the distributions of this section under the LNA. You know, this Gaussian, so everything you know, easy to, to find. You just need to transport your system in different coordinates and, and yeah, take conditional distribution and so on. A bit of part of that we can get this out and yeah, and compare that with the stochastic simulation algorithms, and you see that they match very well. So this is, I'm showing you one dimension, there is on the section, there are n minus one dimension. If the system is 10 dimensional, then the section is nine dimensional. So in this n minus one dimensions, we are doing really well with the LNA, yeah? Which is very useful because, you know, we have, we can choose a phase that you're interested in, say the maximum of uh, an important variable, and you can get a very nice, a uh, very accurate approximation with the model that you can work out analytically. So you can study this very uh, carefully. So we use that quite a lot in our analysis later on. But also going back to, you know, so we have nine out of 10 dimensions behaving nicely and we can approximate the world. What about the 10th dimension? The 10th dimension is the tangential one, which is related to phase. So that's the one we expect that would be tricky. To do so, we see this phase drift here. So, to study the phase drift, we said, okay, we're going to compare the period of the system of the deterministic system, yeah, the, the usual about 24 hours for the flow, with the stochastic period. So, letting you know, every time it's crossing the section, we're going to collect the time that it crossed it to see what's the difference with the uh, deterministic period. And you know, have 3,000 of them in every round, so we can draw histogram again. And in this case, I'm showing you the, the variance of, of the difference of the two periods, which you see that the variance increases over time, you kind of going up without something somehow from stopping this increase. It kind of explains why uh, we have these drifts. So you kind of, the variance is slowly and growing. In, in terms of phase uh, without control. So that's why you get the phase drift. So it explains why we have this poor accuracy. But on the other hand, the fact that it's increasing in this kind of uh, linear way, so it's well controlled, and maybe, well, 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 we 
the fact that linearly increasing allows us maybe to control it. Okay? You imagine if it was like if the pattern here was chaotic, then wouldn't be able to know how to really uh, control that and how do we control it and so on. But it's nicely increasing uh, linearly. So we said, okay, maybe we can control it. So the, the way, yeah. So putting two things together before I say how do we control it is you have n minus one dimension that LNA is approximating very well, and then one that is not approximating well, but still doesn't seem to be crowded, it seems to be kind of like con control way that, uh, yeah, that we're failing, so maybe we can fix it. So that's what we need. So the simulation, just explain in terms of simulation, it's easier to explain the model. So uh, the way it goes is we start with any given state of the system, and then you perform the standard and the main transition step. So you use your data diffusion matrix to make a jump of uh, length t, and then um, you see the current state, and, and then you make a correction. So if it's you see whether it was faster or slower than expected, so in this case faster than expected because it's a mystic system. And yeah, and then you kind of correct all this. So you find the phase of the system that is closer to the stochastic state. You adjust the stochastic part, which is now on the transversal section of this phase. So it's uh, behaving like the transversal section that we said earlier. And then progress uh, just like before with an LNA step. So you're just adding this phase correction of the equal step of the system, which kind of doesn't allow the phase of the stochastic state to drift too much far away from the deterministic one. And that's all you need uh, to, to control this uh, thing. And that works very well. So it gives very good approximation of the and the rest of the algorithm simulation, but it's the same. Um, yeah, we compared also with Paulik and the Kinnegan and Brown equation approximations. They, you know, they give similar uh, accuracy with the PCLNA, but PCLNA is way much faster. Yeah, so you have uh, yeah, way much faster simulation than uh, what you need with the SP or the other approximation algorithms. So that was all good in terms of simulation. Right, now, uh, what about uh, estimation and so on? So say we have time series data, and we observe our uh, system in T plus one times, and we we want to get, you know, we have to get the likelihood of, of what this data for a parameter value. So we essentially want to get the probability distribution yeah, of, of this for the parameter value. Maybe you choose the you know the best parameter value for uh, uh, for this likelihood, so the one that maximizes the likelihood, or the Bayesian inference, as I will talk a bit later. Uh, so we need to build uh, one more equation, the measurement equation or observation equation, uh, which is saying that okay, so you might. You have the state, the underlying state, which is the stochastic thing that I was describing. But actually, what we observe might be slightly different from uh, the underlying state uh, in two ways. One is that that might be some measurement error, so which is you know just your technology has some error, extra error compared to the kind of uh, the stochasticity in the system. And also, maybe you don't observe exactly all the variables, or maybe you observe a function of the variable. So, for example, in the SIR model, maybe you only observe the effective individual. In this case, the P would be 0, 1, 0 to kill off the S and R populations and just keep the infected individuals. So, have the observation equation combined with the uh, PCLNA equations, and uh, you can compute the likelihood in this way. You don't have, because you build this extra error, you don't have this congruency which will give you that this um, the joint distribution of this data, the T plus one time points 
will um, yeah have a nice normal distribution, but still the you can break down the likelihood of these factors with this product there. And then each individual pair goes, yeah, and you can configure this in this algorithm, the karma filter algorithm, which is fairly standard. It's not the usual karma filter, which is a bit more simple, but you kind of extended the idea of the karma filter to be able to compute these factors, right? It might look a bit nasty, but it's not really. We just have lots of uh, matrices uh, being multiplied there and maybe inverted in some case, which may be a bit more tricky. But generally, uh, yeah, it's it's working okay. So I won't go into the details of it. Maybe just to say that you have cycles, as you might know, since you have one statement, you go back and you repeat it. And every time you get one uh, output of this uh, product and one factor that goes into the likelihood. So you have the first one in the first cycle, and then straight away from your you know, input. Uh, and then, yeah, you, you use the base rule, the base theorem to update, and then do the LMA steps, and you go to what gives you the second kind of state given the first observation, use the observation equation to get um, the second term, and then you keep doing this for two times until you get all the terms. Yeah, I think that wasn't necessary, but I didn't look like you're supposed to, but yeah, it's fine. Right, so what we want to do for inference, we want to do Bayesian inference. So if you're a statistician, this looks a bit too much to present, but anyway, um, another wide audience of the include one. So a uh, slide about the Bayesian inference. So the target, as in most of these things in parameters, you want to estimate some the unknown values of the parameters. The difference with other, with the classical, say, uh, statistical inference is that in Bayesian inference, you treat the unknown parameter as random variables themselves, and you allocate a prior distribution on them. So that's kind of the uncertainty that you have about the parameters or the knowledge, if you like, that you have about the parameters without seeing your data. And you combine this with the likelihood. And that gives you, with base theorem, it gives you the posterior. So what you know about the parameter given the data. Yeah. So in most cases, we cannot get an explicit expression for the posterior. And often we use Markov chain and the Gallo methods to estimate that. So the idea of Monte Gallo, uh, of the MCMC methods, is that you create Markov chains of the parameters. So you sample your parameters in the Markov chain, uh, which has a equilibrium distribution of the posterior. So once you, you know, converge to the equilibrium distribution, you have samples of your posterior. Uh, so, and, you know, it's a huge literature in statistics and other things, so I won't go into that, but, you know, the suitability depends on the, the settings that we have. In this case, the key characteristic is suppose that you have lots of parameters which are linked to each other. So you might have a species which has, you know, you want to just import the birth, and death rate of these species, so they're kind of very highly linked to each other. Remember, let me know if I'm running out of time. We have another time. Oh, so many. About oh. 10 minutes. Oh. 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so um, I think I'm going to skip this then. Uh, that's a method that seems to be that, that we use. Feel free to ask me later on. And uh, I'm tempted to say about it, but I think now, yeah, I'll skip it. So, uh, right, so we applied this uh, method and some other methods as, as well. We prefer that part of temporary MCMC because it kind of allows us to cope with this situation that you might have different maxima in your posterior because you have linked, yeah, you have linked uh, parameters. So you might have different combinations of values that give you put uh, fit to the data, so we want to be able to explore that, and Iron Temple allows you to do that. Um, so we applied this to the clock, we simulated the data of the clock, and we simulated using the VLSP, the SSA algorithm. Um, yeah, and we made uh, estimates, which are reasonably good, as you might see, we have a true value fairly fitting well with the uh, um, yeah, with the posterior distribution, so you see there. 
Um, right, but okay. So works reasonably well if you target some specific parameters, but here we have lots of parameters. So the main problem is the whether we can actually have we, whether we actually have the information to estimate them. So the clock model has 41 parameters, then the clock and B model has 30 parameters, the ones where it works in the right way. So it's a lot of parameters which are highly linked. So there is a question, a reasonable question to ask whether we have the information in the data to estimate it and when we have that and so on. So we used a tool called Fission Information Matrix to study how sensitive is the likelihood to change within the parameter values. And so normally this is very hard to compute when you have a kind of strange distribution, but because we have uh, normal distributions, yes, the mean and variance, they are, you know, it might be big if you have lots of time points and you have a uh, large system and so on, but still, you know, it's a bunch of all things that you can solve and then that gives you an efficient information matrix, so it's feasible to compute. Uh, yeah, so we computed that and we did it so you can do it with the kind of group that if you want to get uh, the likelihood and the corresponding fission information for time series, but this is heavy computationally and well, it's doable, but it's heavy computationally. We did something more simple, which is to say, okay, instead of Sort of time series trajectory, I'm going to use a phase trajectory, meaning that I'm going to allow the system to jump from one selected phase to another selected phase and another selected phase, and so on. So you can select as many phases as you want, essentially, and do these phase trajectories and compute this distribution, which you know, if you choose a lot, it would be very high dimensional, but still is a normal. To the normal thing which you can compute and get efficient information for it. So we computed the efficient information matrix for these phase trajectories and we studied the sensitivity uh, to parameters for this distribution and see what value does it have in terms of estimation, what does it tell us about estimation. So we Use, I mean, uh, not getting into the details of, of that, but we kind of did different decompositions of this matrix to uh, define sensitivity coefficients. So, these coefficients that measure how sensitive is the likelihood to changes in each parameter. And so, we said, okay, so we can identify the two most sensitive parameters, the one that have a higher sensitivity parameter, uh, high sensitivity in the likelihood. Uh, here and see whether we can estimate them uh, for some data and using our methods, so, yeah, which we did reasonably well uh, in this case. But then what happens if you start adding lower sensitivity parameters? So there are two questions there, whether, you know, whether the sensitivity analysis actually tells you which are the parameters are uh, estimable. And yeah, and then what you can do about it. And so, right. So in this case, we have uh, one parameter which is very, has very high sensitivity, much higher than all the others. And then we're adding some parameters that have lower sensitivity to see what happens. And we get uh, the estimates and you see that like for these very high sensitive parameters, the posterior means so the our estimate is very close to the true value. That's decimal difference, which we can then see. Uh, we're doing reasonably with, with this parameter, which is also has sort of smaller sensitivity, but still not as low as the others. But as you go to lower sensitivity parameters, your the quality of your estimate becomes equal to the less accurate parameters, and we get all kind of problems actually. Uh, in estimation. So to kind of demonstrate a bit this further, we said, okay, we will get different parameters which have different sensitivity coefficients and plot them against a measure of the noise that we have in the posterior. 
So this is the one we use is posterior uh, coefficient of deviation. So that's like the posterior standard deviation versus the mean. So if you have high variance in your posterior, we should show up there. And you see that, yeah, the sensitivity relates a lot to the accuracy to like of your estimates. So you have high sensitivity, uh, less noise, yeah, in here. And this is reflected in lots of simulations that we use. So, uh, the, you know, what you think is uh, in CNC uh, methods, when you apply them, the thing that we worry about is convergence uh, of your chains. We worry about uh, mixing, so if they're jumping and exploring the space as well. So, we saw that it's much harder to get all these nice properties for the low sensitivity parameters. It's easier for the high sensitivity parameters. So you see that they're sort of nicely behaving, uh, the high sensitivity parameters much is nicer behaving in the sense that they, you know, well, they go roughly to the same place. You can get this situation at the low sensitivity point to a very different place that's what you want to, to go. Or you have the same jumps and those like block jumps, uh, uh, and so on. So you get all kind of problems here. Okay, uh, right. That's I think I can probably skip that. That's different. So that was the data again that we showed you earlier. This is for the NCAP and B. So we showed you a table earlier. This is the posterior distribution. The kind of uh, yeah, plotting two parameters against each other there, or the individual histograms, and the chains that happen, with, yeah, the chains in this two-dimensional space. So you see the one we have high sensitivity, how nice is the distribution around it. This one is also nicely behaving. And you see the maximum modality, the maximum maximum that we can get uh, in some parameters. Uh, yeah, and that we are doing much better with the high sensitivity parameters compared to the low sensitivity parameters. So this is something that you know we kind of try to emphasize uh, in this paper that uh, quite often, you know, especially in statistics, we focus on you know the, the method or the NCFC method, which one is the best to estimate. But we don't have the capacity. Usually, we, we're not able to study the sensitivity, or we cannot do sensitivity analysis equally complicated with the actual estimation. So we kind of forget about the sensitivity, which tells you whether you actually have, you know, whether any algorithm would work. So this is a situation where you can actually do this analysis, and it shows you that it's important. You know, it gives you valuable information. That was a key message of this paper, but. Hopefully, come out soon. Okay, so a few things that uh, also came up. This is a paper that we studied the clock um, and asked questions, you know, experimental design questions mainly, you know, which are the right time points to measure and which are the variables that you should target uh, to get more information depending on the sensitivity analysis. And this is another paper that we use the sensitivity analysis to study, uh, you know, because the NFLP system has kind of multiple uh, signals arriving there. So how does it record to different signals? And uh, yeah. And then finally, do you have? Okay, okay. So that's. Uh, Think that tries to expand the idea of uh, PCLNA to other systems or the whole application systems, if you're familiar with that. So, the kind of core idea of PCLNA is to when you have a large dimensional system where the kind of the nonlinear dynamics are mainly few directions, then what you can do is you uh, model the linear dynamics with the name that control the nonlinear dynamics. So I'm thinking that if you have a large dimensional system which has a whole bifurcation which will be two dimensional there, and that's when the nonlinear dynamics, the troublesome dynamics happen, then what we can do is kind of control the nonlinear dynamics, use your LNA there, which will speed up. So 
in this case, we, are, we tried that for simulation. We're still working to understand more. But in terms of simulation, it's, yeah, you can feel the simulation output with, which works very uh, well. It's very fast and uh, yeah, it's very fast to work and very accurate at the same time. So hoping to finish up this soon. Right, so just to summarize, uh, okay, so general things that biological assistance give rise to lots of nice uh, challenges, both methodological and computational, because of the non trivial stochasticity, the dynamics, the non real dynamics, identifiability issues, and so on. There are not many models that they are at the same time accurate and fast and they can scale to these large systems. Uh, and we provide a solution for the specific set of the oscillatory systems. And hopefully we can expand this to more uh, systems with different dynamics. So in this case, you know, for this case at least we, we are able to simulate fast with 2 d species information, which is analysis and two laser inputs. Let's see that it's going to be